Well, good evening and welcome to Ask the Pastor, uh, our midweek study. Uh, tonight, we're tackling an issue um, uh, on how is sin imputed to you and to me. Um, now, now, you might not get that, but let me read the question, then we uh, start walking through some of the answer. Uh, here's the question. Jesus was without sin. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of a woman. How did he not inherit a sin nature? Does scripture teach that our sin nature is passed down through our human father? I understand where that question is coming from. <clears throat> uh, much of it is coming from historical ideas, uh, uh, theological ideas, uh, but primarily driven from Romans chapter 5, beginning verse 12. Uh, let me read uh, Romans chapter 5, beginning verse 12. We'll read through verse 19. Uh, therefore, uh, Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Big sentence, lots of phrases. Let me read it again. Therefore, just as <coughs> through one man, that's Adam, sin entered the world, pointing back to Genesis chapter 3, and death through sin. So the result of sin, uh, of Adam's sin is death. And thus death spread to all men. Every person dies because Adam uh, set up the consequence of sin uh, as death in Genesis 3. So, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned, verse 13, uh, for until, uh, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgressions of Adam, who is, verse 14, who is a type of him, that's a capital H, type of Jesus who was to come. Verse 15, but the free, free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came, through, uh, came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one, verse 17, if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. As verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, but where sin abounded, uh, uh, um, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience <coughs> many will be re made righteous. All right, so in those verses, 5, 12 through 19, um, just a couple of quick statements, and then let's try to look at how did we get the sin nature. All right, so first, sin came through Adam. The problem of sin begins with the story of Adam. Because God himself is righteous, he demands righteous of his creation. Uh, righteousness simply means we do what God wants. Moses wrote that Adam and Eve chose sin rather than obedience, and that choice propelled humanity on a downward spiral of depravity. Uh, Paul's point is that sin, although not clearly defined under the shining light of the law, so that's for uh, verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. So. Um, we'll see in a couple of weeks uh, uh, in Romans chapter 1 that God has put uh, his uh, rules on the hearts of people so that they know when they do right or wrong. Um, but the law itself didn't happen until Moses. So from Adam to Moses, there is no codified 
law. Uh, Paul is simply saying that uh, sin was there. Law made it very clear that it was sin. Um, uh, so here are, in this passage, there, there are four points that I want you to see about Adam. First, sin came through one man, Adam. Second, Adam's disobedience made many sinners. That's verse 19. Uh, three, universal death proves universal sin. So <clears throat> said a couple of times in this passage that um, one man sinned and death spread to all men because all have sinned. Um, verse 12, that is proof that we're all sinners. Remember Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, and then Romans 6.23, that's about to come, the wage of sin is death. Those two um, uh, statements, uh, in the middle of it is, here's how sin happened. Uh, death came through one man and spread uh, to all, and all have sinned. Um, so there is uh, uh, universal death, everybody dies, uh, that proves universal sin, the consequence. Death is the consequence of sin. So uh, sin came through Adam. Adam's disobedience made many sinners. Uh, universal death proves universal sin. And four, Adam's sin brings condemnation for all. Look at verse 16. Uh, for, um, uh, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. Look at verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense... Judgment came to all people, resulting in condemnation. <clears throat> um, Adam's sin brings condemnation toward all people. Uh, so uh, those four points help us begin to understand a little bit about how uh, we inherited sin. Um, though Adam, uh, through Adam, sin and death reigned, through Jesus Christ, the gift of grace overflowed to sinners, through Adam, condemnation came to humanity. Through Christ, justification came to sinners. Uh, through Adam, death reigned. Through Christ, life reigns. Through Adam, we were made sinners. Through Christ, we were made righteous. So how do we explain this inherited depravity condemnation? Um, there are um, uh, a couple of, uh, really two, two main <clears throat> ways of looking at how Sin, the sin nature, is inherited. <clears throat> the first is imputation of guilt or sin by uh, propagation. Um, I'm, using, uh, I'm using particular language. Uh, some, uh, some theologians have looked at Genesis 3 and Romans 5, the birth of Jesus uh, of the Holy Spirit, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who are under the law. In Galatians 4, um, they look at all those passages and they suggest that depravity is inherited or imputed by bloodline. So uh, as this question asked, does Scripture teach that our sin nature is passed down through the human father? Um, uh, specifically, uh, these theologians that agree with that, uh, that would answer yes according to that question, uh, they conclude that humanity existed not individually, but seminally, not just individually, but seminally in Adam. Uh, and thus the imputation uh, of sin's guilt or the condemnation is passed seminally uh, through Adam to all human beings. So uh, we receive uh, that sin nature by bloodline, uh, by propagation. Um, and uh, it comes through the bloodline of the Father. Now, um, the cats that, that have embraced that, um, John Calvin would be one of the guys that embraces that viewpoint. Uh, <coughs> Augustine, whom Calvin followed, embraced that. Some of the uh, 17th, uh, but primarily 18th and 19th century um, scholars embraced that. Uh, I don't embrace that. I do not think that the sin nature is inherited uh, through the natural propagation of humanity through the Father's breadline. So what is the relationship between Adam 
you know, millennia ago and my guilt today. Um, so it's not imputation by propagation, but secondly, and this is the view I hold, it's imputation by representative. Uh, the representative or federal theory of imputation suggests that God appointed Adam as the representative of all humanity. Thus, when Adam sinned, God imputed to all humanity the guilt of Adam as representative. Uh, now, Romans 5, 12 through 19 clearly says that we were involved in some way in Adam's sin. <clears throat> this representative view declares that, quote, Adam acted on behalf of all people. Um, and so because Adam was representative of humanity at the beginning of time, a type of Christ, of one who is to come at the beginning of time, then uh, when he sinned, that guilt uh, is imputed to all those whom he represents. But Romans 5 also teaches us that Jesus um, is uh, the one man who uh, represents all humanity. And as Adam brought condemnation, Jesus as representative uh, brings grace through his sacrificial death on the cross, taking the punishment of sin upon himself. So he died for sinners. Uh, he was representative. And that's what Paul is talking about here. No matter your theological system, you've got to embrace that statement. So you have um, Adam and you have Christ. Um, and the reality is that this guilt that is imputed uh, is uh, an unconscious guilt. Oh, um, um, there, uh, it is guilt by nature, right? Because of Adam's sin. Um, but then that leads to the question, what do we do with, um, now, uh, as an adult, uh, as someone who very early understood uh, that um, I could be obedient to God or disobedient to God and I choose disobedience to God. Uh, certainly my sin uh, nature uh, that uh, I inherited through uh, my representative, Adam, <coughs> inclined me to disobedience, but it became a reality when I disobeyed. Uh, I am guilty because I'm of Adam, um, but I am guilty because I have sinned. Well, what do you do with those uh, who are infants or um, who don't have, uh, don't reach that that point of moral um, uh, competence. Uh, Millard Erickson, a Baptist theologian, uh, notes that the imputation of guilt and condemnation, quote, are imputed to us um, without, uh, being, uh, without there being any part, uh, any, uh, being on our part, any sort of conscious choice of, his, uh, of Adam's act. So we've received guilt not based upon our choices, but based upon Adam's choice. Yet the parallelism in, in Romans 5 uh, would say that um, there, is that the same, is the same thing true with the righteousness that Christ provides? So just as we inherited guilt, do we then unconsciously inherit righteousness? Uh, of course, the answer is no. Um, if there, but the question is, if there's no unconscious faith, can there be unconscious sin? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, we are guilty because Adam, our representative, died. But we are made righteous, and the penalty, the price for sins, uh, 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 the price for sins, uh, guilt being removed was done by Jesus as our representative. But uh, in order to receive that, it's not an unconscious faith. It is something that we exercise. We choose Christ. And even the most reformed theologians would say we still choose Christ. They give criteria for that, but we choose Christ. Jonathan Edwards, one of his great sermons, uh, you can see it in Jonathan Edwards' collected works. There's a sermon called uh, The Excellencies of Christ. Uh, and at the conclusion of that sermon, he says, choose Christ, choose Christ, choose Christ. So, so uh, in the end, we choose Christ. It's not unconscious faith. It is faith that we exercise. Um, 
So what Erickson does is he takes that parallel, parallelism in Romans 5 and he says there's, uh, there is unconscious faith, but that faith is actualized in a person to where they are um, um, held responsible uh, when they come to the age of moral competence. Uh, here's, here's what he writes. Let me read this. Uh, we all were involved in Adam's sin and thus received both the corrupted nature that was his after the fall and the guilt and condemnation that attached to his sin. With this matter of guilt, however, uh, just as with the imputation of Christ's righteousness, there must be some conscious and voluntary decision on our part. Until this is the case, there is only the conditional <clears throat> imputation of guilt. Thus, there's no condemnation until one reaches the age of responsibility. So how do we receive um, uh, our sin nature? We receive our, our, uh, our sin nature from Adam. That's what Romans 5.12 says very clearly. How does that happen? Well, I believe it happens because there... Adam was our representative, and as, um, as our representative, we now have been cast in this downward spiral of depravity because of his sin, We've it, 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 and yet uh, it is a conditional uh, imputation of guilt until we actually sin or until we recognize our sin, uh, moral responsibility. Um, uh, and, and that's my view. Uh, you can uh, view it. Now, the, then the question is, why was Jesus born of the Holy Spirit and born of a woman? Um, and, and the answer to that question is because um, there had to be a disconnect between Adam, the representative of humanity, and Jesus. It, it's not the bloodline. It's, it's not, uh, pardon me, it's not the semen. It is, it is uh, Adam as our representative. And there needed to be a disconnect so that Jesus, uh, his, his representative is the Godhead. Um, and, uh, and, and yet he was fully human because he was born of a woman. Um, all that's deep water and it may or may not help to talk about things in that way. I hope it does help. Here's the bottom line. We are all guilty uh, and dead in our sin and trespass. All of us. All of sin falls short of the glory of God. Our sin... Um, is um, uh, our sin has killed us. Our sin kills not because, uh, sin kills because it's sin, not because it's a big sin. Uh, any minor sin kills. So we're all dead in our sin and trespass. Uh, we've received that nature of sin from Adam, our representative. We receive righteousness through our representative Jesus who died for our sin upon a cross, was raised from the dead. All right? Uh, next week, we're answering the question, what does it mean to live in Christ? What does it mean to live in Christ? Hope to see you then.